You met uh, the new British Prime Minister this week um, and you made some comments afterwards which kind of questioned his impartiality. I'm wondering when Boris Johnson says that he believes in the spirit and the, the word of the Good Friday Agreement, do you believe him? Well, I don't think anybody believes that Boris Johnson is in the least bit impartial when it comes to Ireland. I mean, he's, he's said very directly himself that he will never be neutral on the issue of the union with Britain because, of course, he's a unionist. And on one level, that's fair enough. That's his politics. That's his disposition. But it's actually his relationship with the DUP which gives the lie to any impartiality. And I'm not necessarily talking about the fact that he had dinner with them. I mean the fact that his administration and previous administrations have assisted the DUP in the denial of rights, basic rights that are enjoyed across this island and in Britain. I'm talking about marriage equality, I'm talking about reproductive rights, I'm talking about language rights, and they have actively colluded with rejectionist unionism to stop those things happening. And that's the real test of impartiality. That's the real test of being rigorously fair. That's the test of leading from the front. And when I met Boris Johnson yesterday, I mean, we put, put the case around Brexit, around a whole range of issues, very directly to him, so that he's left in no doubt as to where things sit at the moment in the north of Ireland and across the island. And he didn't say anything back to us that indicated to me that there would be a change of direction or a change of heart. I think he, like I suppose every British Prime Minister, looks at Ireland only through the prism of British interests, and in his case, English interests, and in his case, the interests of the Conservative Party, which, bear in mind, had a very bad election day out, which has been at sixes and sevens over the issue of Brexit, and it strikes me that his number one priority is himself, the Tories, uh, Britain, in that order, uh, and Ireland, frankly, doesn't feature, and I include in that unionism. Unionism isn't a, Irish unionism, Ulster unionism isn't a priority for, for Boris, except for the fact that they happen to be keeping him in government. There is a lot of paranoia um, on the UK side, and there's been a lot of things written and said about Ireland which suggest that it's kind of using the backstop um, as a way to undermine the union being deliberately difficult on Brexit. Are you kind of playing into those fears and that paranoia and making it worse by bringing up the prospect of a border poll in the context of Brexit? No, uh, and let me just start by saying there are those voices that you have described that despite the fact of Brexit being a British idea and in the main an English idea, they somehow want to land it at the feet of Ireland I mean, that's, that's just nonsense and rubbish. But, but you're right to say there are those very aggressive, belligerent voices um, on the other side of the Irish Sea. But don't lose sight of the fact that there are other voices too. There is a huge swell of opinion right across the island of Britain, which looks to Ireland now um, aghast at any idea that any prime minister or any government would upend the peace process that anybody would deliberately and knowingly visit economic damage on their neighbouring island. And they are horrified by that. Regular English people, and I've met them in their hundreds, maybe in their thousands at this stage, are horrified by that prospect. And let me give you just a, a little instance to, to demonstrate to you how politics has, has lost its footing and how everything has changed utterly. I mean, on one occasion, when I was visiting London, I was doing a, a media interview outside Parliament buildings. You know, they have, it's almost like a, a temporary studio. So I was up on a high platform speaking to somebody. It could have been Channel 4, I can't recall exactly. But below me, there is a huge crowd gathered of uh, anti-Brexit protesters, and they're dressed head to toe in Union Jacks. And in the middle of it, there's a guy playing bagpipes. You can picture the scene. They see me, they spot me, they recognise me. So I pause for a second because I'm not sure how this is going to go down. And then up goes the cheer, Sinn Féin, we love you. And then up goes the cheer, peace in Ireland, peace in Ireland, so of course. Now, if anyone had said to you a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, that the Sinn Féin leader would be greeted in such a way by people who literally were dressed head to toe in their national colours, the British colours, you would have said that's the most unlikely thing. Yet that's what happens. So I think for us as, as Irish people, because you hear all the belligerence and you hear all of the blame game 
uh, and you hear the bluster and the bluff of Boris Johnson and we have to deal with that and manage that to, to, to the best of our ability but we should never lose sight of the fact that people in Scotland, people in Wales, people in England itself uh, are with Ireland and they, they do not wish to see their government, their state damage us. I know that absolutely because they have come they they have said that uh, repeatedly. I mean, look, Boris Johnson is the Prime Minister, he's the leader of the Tory party, he is the person now that we have to deal with to advance Irish uh, interests. And I want uh, Sinn Féin to continue what, what I believe has been a very, very valuable role in terms of setting out the Irish position in an uncompromising way in terms of what's needed for this island. I want us to be responsible in how we manage everything. And for me, Brexit of any sort, but certainly a hard disorderly Brexit now in prospect means that we have to talk about the border and we have to talk about the constitutional question. And I'm saying this not to be provocative, it's not to, or to put the Taoiseach or anybody else behind the eighth ball. I'm saying it because we cannot go backwards. We cannot have a repartitioning of Ireland almost a century later. We cannot stand by while the Good Friday Agreement is binned and the clock gets turned back. That would be utterly reckless. The responsible thing to do in an organised, formalised, structured way now is to have the conversation about Ireland post-Brexit, about Irish unity, about a new Ireland, and to allow space for everyone, including those who will say, it's not my first preference and I'll campaign against it, and my preference is for a continuation of the status quo. That's okay, that's 100%. But all of that body of opinion also has to face the fact that Brexit is the big game changer. And we cannot stand idly by. I mean, that to me, uh, as, a, as a citizen, as a, an elected person, but as a political leader, is unthinkable. So when we talk about the border poll and we talk about the forum on unity, it's because we know that unless this process is managed and very in a very inclusive way, and I believe the Dublin government needs to take the, the, the lead in that, if it's not managed, well, then we face not only the real prospect of a disorderly Brexit, but following that in a very disorderly way, stumbling into a very complex uh, and a very important debate about the future of Ireland. I mean, yes, we all know it's going to be absolutely catastrophic if they crash out with no deal, particularly for people in Northern Ireland. And I'm not minimising that, but I wonder, as the leader of Sinn Féin, when you're watching the Conservative Party in absolute disarray, when you're watching uh, a united Ireland actually become something that the Taoiseach and Micheál Martin are now talking about, maybe in your political lifetime, is there any part of you that's sitting back and watching Brexit and actually enjoying this? Absolutely not. I mean, you will know that um, we are Eurocritical. I, I could write the book on what's wrong with the European project and it needs to change. And I think Brexit is symptomatic of big defects and, and the European elite and system not listening. So they need to learn that lesson from Brexit. I could recite that chapter in verse, but Brexit was never the answer. And certainly for Europe, for Ireland, at any stage to have the pace of change set by British Tories was never a good news story. That was never going to be to our advantage. Brexit didn't happen because some of some enlightened view around democracy or the needs of the working class or uh, the needs of workers or the need for equality, the need to challenge the current economic model. No, no, Brexit was always very much about the Tory boys and girls seizing power back for themselves and that was always a disaster for us. So do I enjoy this? No. Do I enjoy the fact that businesses and the farming community and communities more generally are now really, really anxious? People are anxious for their jobs. I mean, this is about people's livelihoods. Uh, and this is about the ability for this island to prosper or not. So the stakes are very high. So no, I don't enjoy it. As a matter of fact, I resent in a, in a way the fact that uh, this reckless, indifferent, belligerent set of steps by the British Tories is actually the backdrop to a conversation that we need to have, which, which needs to be a positive conversation, needs to be a liberating conversation, 
but in politics you play the hand that you're that de that's delivered to you and this is what it is and there is no percentage for anybody now any sensible person any responsible person to look the other way or to try and paint up this episode as something that Sinn Féin will try and profit from I'm an Irish woman I have I have a family I have children I want them to have a future we're all of us in Sinn Féin we come from every walk of life and we want what's right and we want what's best and I think sometimes there's a deliberate evasion tactic by the political establishment here to sidestep their own responsibilities by attributing a bad motive to us and I think that's fairly reprehensible at a time when the stakes for our country couldn't be higher. And on that conversation about United Ireland, obviously we, do, we need to consider what a United Ireland would be like for the Unionists who would live in it. Uh, very briefly, would, you, would Sinn Féin be prepared to stand over like, anything like a change of flag, a change of national anthem, uh, membership of the Commonwealth, and uh, national celebration of the 12th, anything like that? Look, my anthem is Aaron Naveen, my flag is the green, white and orange tricolour. But in the course of a debate that is inclusive, if you call for an inclusive debate, you have to allow for everything to be put on the table. So when we see everything can be put on the table, that's what needs to happen. It doesn't mean I do not favour re-entering the Commonwealth. I don't think there's anything in that for us. I think, it's, I, I think it's a bit of a nonsense suggestion. But if others believe that that's a course of action, well, that's serious. If, if there's a view around any element of symbolism or celebration in a New Ireland, let's talk about that. And as regards unionist identity, I, I think we need to understand that the Good Friday Agreement on core issues around uh, citizenship, core issues around parity of esteem, all of that work is done. You know, that's already hardwired into our system of governance. So we shouldn't create any sense of panic that we're starting from ground zero or that we're setting the clock back for our unionist uh, citizens or unionist brothers and sisters. That's not the case. Work has already been done. The challenge is in a 32 county context to build on that and to collectively decide what that looks like. And we're well, we're well capable of doing that. I, I actually think that has the makings of a very challenging conversation, but actually a very interesting, a very energising conversation as well. Uh, we know that uh, Westminster voted to pass a bill which would legalise marriage equality and decriminalise abortion in Northern Ireland. I'm just wondering, as a leader of Sinn Féin, do you feel any sense of shame or sadness that um, LGBT people and women in this instance might end up being better off because they will have been governed from Westminster? Well, I feel a sense of anger that I know is shared very broadly across uh, Irish society, but in the North in particular, that there has been a deliberate strategy deployed to discriminate against LGBT citizens and women. It, it, it didn't happen by accident. It has been a very, very calculated pushback against the equality agenda. I'm very determined that these issues have to be resolved. The strong preference is that it happens in the assembly because that's important, it's important for everybody that, that politicians elected in Ireland representing Irish constituencies can actually face up to what some regard as very difficult issues, which are highly emotive issues for many people, but that we are capable as a society of navigating that space, resolving those issues and making room for everybody in society. I don't want these issues to be resolved at Westminster, obviously, but I've consistently said that if this current round of talks fails, and I want them to succeed, but if that's not possible, and if we cannot get to an answer in terms of marriage equality and the other issues, well then the two governments are going to have to lift that load because the Good Friday Agreement attributes responsibility in the last instance to the governments to ensure that there is equality, that the equality uh, uh, obligations are met, that there's, there's a shared standard right across the island. So do I want this to happen at Westminster? Absolutely not. I mean, Westminster should not have jurisdiction at all in any respect in, in, in Ireland. But if it is a thing that rejectionist unionism continues to push back and continues to frustrate those things, which the majority of people and elected representatives want, the majority, the big majority want progress. So if they keep pushing back, 
And if we can't, as hard as we try, resolve these matters in party-to-party -party dialogue, then yes, there is an obligation on both governments to meet by way of the Intergovernmental Conference and to figure out legislatively how they unlock these issues. And if it was getting to a point where it's, let, let's say, start of October and it looks like you could actually restore power, but you know that if you leave it until the end of the month, you might actually be able to legalise marriage equality through Westminster, would you be inclined to delay? Um, th this is a big dilemma and I, there's mixed opinions across the north on this. There is a constituency of thought that says, hold on, just wait, just wait. My, my own view is this, that uh, firstly, there won't be an agreement without the rights issues being resolved, clear pathways for their resolution. And my strong preference is that we shoulder the responsibility to resolve these issues in the Assembly. So for me, the issue of delaying the institutions doesn't figure. I don't think, I don't think that would be the right pathway. But I also accept that you would have to be sure that you actually had unionism in a place where they understand that they can no longer block, block these issues. So there's the challenge now, in the current here and now, because the, the, the round of, of talks is up and live, and it's challenging. I, I mean, if you're asking me, do we have these issues resolved now? The answer is we don't. That's, that's the truth. Um, but we can. If there's political will and if minds are focused, these issues can be resolved. And we can have the best of both worlds. We can have a resolution of the rights issues in the Assembly in Belfast. And I, I think that would have the dual effect of resolving the issues, affording that, that level of equality and respect to people, but also done by the Assembly in the North. That matters as, that matters as well. And the abortion legislation, if that is done from Westminster, would Sinn Féin support a law similar to the one we have here where uh, it's free access to abortion up to 12 weeks? What we want is, uh, we're, in all our, we're a national uh, movement and our position on, on the issue of reproductive rights is a national position. And I've said actually, as part of the discussions yesterday um, with the British government, uh, I've advised them that the legislation in the South is actually the template that should apply across the island, yes. And of course the decriminalisation of women uh, is essential. I am advised that some of that legislative change has to happen at Westminster. You know, it's not just one legislative act. So we need to balance all of those things, but the objective here, always and ever, has to, do, has to be to do two things. To ensure in a modern, open, democratic system that every Irish citizen uh, has their place and has their rights. And that's taking account of conscience and religious belief and all of which are very important in a democratic society. But they can never trump the absolute obligation on legislators and government to govern for all, not according to the theological view of any one particular group. We have to legislate for all. And then the second piece of it is legislating for Irish people in Irish institutions. That's, that's, so those are my two, if you like, uh, those are my two priorities. And then very quickly, politics closer to Dublin. Obviously, as a party leader, it's not your ambition to ever be a smaller party propping up Fianna Fáil or Fianna mm -hmm. Gael. But some of the arithmetic looks like they, one of those is probably going to be the bigger party after the next general election. Mm -hmm. If you had to choose, which one is less unappealing, being Leo Bradford's Tronisha <laughs> or Neil, Ma Neil Martin's Tronisha? Isn't it funny how, um, maybe this is because we're the, as you say, smaller party, but it's, I, I, I was saying to in previous interviews, why does the girl has okay, to be the Tronisha? Well, who would you rather have a Tronisha, Leo Bradford <laughs> Indeed, or Neil well, Martin? Indeed, well that's a different question. Look, neither Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael are natural partners in government first. Like, I'm not breaking any great news by telling you that. I mean, they couldn't be more different from us. They're, they're the, 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 they are the backbone of the political establishment here. They've run this place since the foundation of the state. They clearly don't want us in government, by the way. They're doing everything they can at every opportunity to say, Sinn Féin know that we're not fit for government to keep us out. And the reason they want to keep us out is because they know that the only way that we will ever be in is if we can affect real substantial big change across Irish society. So that means in terms of public services, means in terms of our economic model, it means in, in terms of you know, creating a society where we move away from the insiders and the outsiders and the entitled classes and then the rest of us, the mass of us. So we're a challenge to all of that. So 
they're not chomping at the bit either party that you've mentioned to kind of bring us in, you know? So, so there's a dilemma for us. There isn't a natural partner in either of those parties. There is an opportunity with other politics um, to develop an alternative, a left and a progressive alternative. That would be my, my ideal uh, option if it Which were available. Great. Like we all would love to have our ideals. Absolutely. But I mean, Short one of, of that them must be less terror like less of a terrible idea to you. Well no, I mean short of that, the question then becomes less about the who and more about the what. Because Sinn Fein won't be on government unless it is a thing that we really can change things. And if it is a thing that Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael are simply in the business of covering their own backs protecting the status quo, which is generally what they do, and then brushing aside any big change in terms of the housing market, for example, or how we provide health services. If that's the case, well, then we're not going to be in a position to agree a programme for government, and Sinn Féin won't be in government. If, however, if we have a sufficient mandate, if we have enough numbers, um, and if we can find a way to shift beyond the blockages, and an opportunity to deliver for people, we will grab it with both hands. But I want to tell you, there is absolutely no possibility of us being in government just to be in government, to sort of stick our chests out and, you know, the pomp and ceremony of being a minister. I would have no interest in that. And our party would resist that very strongly. But if we have a chance to do big things and to deliver for people, of course we're going to grasp that. People vote for us because they like our analysis, they hear our politics, they know that there are alternatives, but they also vote for us in the expectation of delivery. It's not that we're not a debating society, we're political activists and we want a new Ireland and that means we have to roll up our sleeves and do the things to make that happen, but it won't be at any cost and you know pol politicians are often painted up, sometimes rightly, as just eager for their own career. Like, the, all of this just becomes an elaborate career ladder. That's not the case for me. I mean, if I wanted politics as a career ladder, I'd have made very different choices, um, to be absolutely blunt with you. Um, and Sinn Féin is not a vehicle for individual ambitions and careers. That's just not what we're about. We're the party of the big idea. We're the party of Irish unity, of social equality. So those are the things that will guide us when we make uh, a decision as and when it arises. And let me finally say, so I don't mislead anyone, I'm not a bit presumptuous about all of this. All of this is premised on people actually having confidence in you and people also being willing to take a different course and to give us an opportunity. You know this thing of you're all the same. We're actually not all the same. And the clearest evidence of Sinn Féin not being the same is the absolute um, determination of those who are the same to keep us out. Um, last year we celebrated Vote All 100, 100 years since uh, suffrage. I was at an event where the Taoiseach, I think caused a little bit of offence, where he said that the first female Taoiseach is probably uh, a schoolgirl at the moment. I wonder, do you think that the first female Taoiseach has already been elected to the 32nd doll? I hope so. Do you think it's you? I very much so. Well, why not? Why not? I mean, um, what would be wrong with a Sinn Féin Taoiseach, a woman Taoiseach, a progressive, a united Ireland? That would be wonderful. If that happens to me, be well, so, so be it, like, no pressure. <laughs> um, I think, you see, we need to be careful when we talk about women in public life that we don't get into a space where it's nice in theory. Like, people, oh, that's a great idea. But then when the women in political life actually present as leaders or as elected representatives that actually, for some reason, they don't quite measure up. Or, yes, we would like a woman in leadership, but just not you. I've seen this happen internationally. It's, it's fascinating. Make a very fascinating study. So... Women are not homogenous, as you know. Women come from every point of the political and ideological spectrum. For me, the important thing is that as a gender, irregardless of the, the, your political point of view, that we are present and that we are visible. And then my priority is that we have progressive women. We have women who aren't going to sit meekly in the corner, 
you know, and nod approvingly at what is a broken, dysfunctional system. I want women who come in and challenge the status quo. So that's what Sinn Féin women do. That, that's, that's in our, our DNA. That's what Republican women have always done. And sometimes that gets us into a bit of hot water because when you're outside of the, the political establishment bubble, it, it means that at times the political establishment come after you that's, and, and criticise you and will, will, will try and sometimes even slap you down. But as a woman, as a feminist and as an Irish Republican, the important thing is that you rise again and that you come back again. Because for us to deliver a change, yes, it's about who's Taoiseach and who leads and how we understand leadership, but it's much more fundamentally about what the grassroots look like and that schoolgirl that the Taoiseach re referred to. What, what does politics say to that child now? Because if that schoolgirl doesn't see not just women, but women that, that she can identify with and women that can put fire in her belly and women that can spur her on to be ambitious and not just to deliver more of the same. Well, in circumstances like that, as the mother of children and as a woman with a, a teenage daughter, I, I think if we don't lead from the front in every way for that generation, then we're failing them.